Lavin High School that was actually uh, developed in 1978 from the protest against Bill 101. If our kids went out to other schools, you would actually have to sign a paper saying that you were immigrants in order to go into the school. So a bunch of parents decide to take matters in their own hands and form Gunhoggy Survival School. Our, the first school was actually, the site over there was actually the first place we started out. Well, we started out in Gunwagi, then we built our own school at the whole site, and it was like a campus style. We had buildings in different places and everything else. Each kid traveled. This has been here for almost 10 years, this new building we just moved into. It's been for 10 years and everything else. I've been working here since 1995 as a teacher. Left for one year for working on curriculum. Then I came back as associate principal. Then I'm back here as principal for the last couple of years. Um, both of my children graduate from Gunawagi Survival School. I have one kid that just graduated from a university in New York City. And one at Miguel just finished her master's in history. So with, uh, with Gunawagi Survival School, it builds like your culture, your language, your pride in who you are. You have to believe who you are and where you come from in order to succeed and walk in life. So it's very important that we still listen to our students here at the school. Our curriculum is unique. It's we develop our own curriculum. We look at what on the outside is being offered and we try to more or less uh, mirror more or less what's going on out there but not losing our culture and language. It's very, very important to teach our kids their culture all their stories, all the legends, everything else that's involved in uh, social studies. We don't do the history program that they have on the outside, we do our own program. And we developed two textbooks that we use uh, in our school. One is the, the Great Tree for grade seven and eight. It's a social studies based curriculum based on our culture. And then we have one for grade nine, 10 and 11 that just got developed a couple years ago. We're just actually working on it more, on this more because we're adding a lot more activities, history to it that happened within the last couple of years in Gun in Gun um, so Thank you. Where's my co-partner? Okay. My co-partner today is Dwayne. He is a social studies teacher. He's been here longer than I've been here, and he really he he's going to explain a little bit more about the history, the culture of the school, and everything else. And then we're going to give you a tour of the school itself. And maybe show you, show you the textbooks that we use. Just to, you know. Yeah, I'm talking to the white jacket. Oh. <laughs> I'm going to be late. She's, I'm checking in for supper. You guys were a little late, so I'm checking with the wife. <laughs> I, I, understand. I hope all you guys understand that. That's where I'm at. <laughs> Uh, my name is Dwayne. Uh, as Jackie said, I've been here 30, this is 30 years now. This is my 38th year. And I tell some people that I don't believe that I've lasted this long with high school kids. Okay? But that's how it is. Um, I have to babysit my grandson at 6 o'clock, and so she's saying, when are you coming home? So the next time it rings, I'm going to turn it over to my partner, Dave. <laughs> who's been working with me here for 28 years. So I got to run in a little bit. Um, the school, as she said, started as a campus on the other side. And we also started in the village area. In the first years, Mr. Deer, Kenneth, was my guidance counselor in high school. And he, yeah, he was really young. I think he was 12. <laughs> spot okay so I've been here that long and I was here when the school started being built a campus that we had over there and this school started out of a protest so when people wonder why we you know we protest things and we're we're always like don't follow all the rules it's because this place started in a protest in 76 bill 101 was passed in Quebec and by 78, the government was saying, you need an English license to go to school in Quebec. Most of our kids were in the neighboring community of Shadgy. That's where I went to high school. They went to high school there. And you needed to get this permit. 
And in September of 78, the kids went to the school and they asked the principal if they would let us in. Can we get in? And he told them, no, you got to get this permit. You have to have the permit. I, he says, I can't do anything, guys. So from there, everybody walked back here and uh, they all met in the village area. I don't know if you were in the village area yet. And basically guys like Kenneth and a few other founders said, come back in a couple of days, we're gonna have a high school for you. <laughs> yeah, it took about a, two, three days. Now the school committee people already knew the answer was probably gonna be no. So they, I think they already had people lined up as teachers and books and buildings were reserved just in case. And when the no came, survival school was born. So that was on September 11th in 20, oh no, 1978. 1978, so we're on 40 years now. So we started in a protest and you know, we've been going along like this. Uh, I, I wasn't listening to Jackie when she introduced herself because I was talking to the wife. <laughs> so, so the school here has always changed programming according to the needs of the kids. Whatever the kids need, that's what we try to do. Um, as we go along, there's a need for something new, we try it. Uh, as curriculum, we make our own curriculum. So things change here every few years. Uh, something new comes along. My newest one is archaeology. We started archaeology. So now I'm doing archaeology around here. I started teaching as a carpentry teacher. I was on a house, sitting on the roof, putting shingles on. And a guy came up, he says, Dwayne, you want to be a teacher? <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> but I talked to the, my boss, and my boss said, try it. So I came here, and I became the carpentry teacher. And I had to go to McGill University, and I got my teaching papers. And, you know, it's a, been a long way now. It's been 30 years later, I'm still doing this. Like a lifetime. Oh, you're like, I'm not, yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So that's how I got into this. I was a carpentry teacher for 20 some odd years. And then they needed a math teacher, and they needed a history teacher. So they moved me over to that. So now I teach history. So, um,. I do a lot of the history in town. On the side, I do tour guiding in the town, for the town of Gunawagi, because they need people who know the history. So that's where I'm at with this. Jackie keeps getting me to do the little tours all the time. Usually my crowds are four or five people. <laughs> this is a bigger crowd today, but that's okay. Um, like I said, I did tours in the town and I usually have a bus with a microphone and it's great. I like that. Now, as far as the program, I said we, we change it. And the parents are in charge here. Parents, there's a school committee, that's the top. Then we have a, a school board kind of thing and they take the orders from the school committee and then they tell Jackie basically what's going on. So the parents, basically have the final say of everything that goes on. And that's how things get changed around here. If you need a change, follow the channels back up, gets to the top and they make the decisions on if we're gonna do stuff. Um, the kids are doing three different languages here. We have English, we have French, and we have Ganyageha. And we have basically all the same courses most high schools will have. But like Jackie said, we try to introduce culture into everything we do. We'll try to put language in. The carpentry program will do things like cradle boards and baskets and rattles, besides the regular stuff. The art classes have all arts that are native themed arts, a lot of it. They still do the other stuff, but we try to do that. My social studies history class does uh, grade 9, we talk about indigenous people in the world. Grade 10, we talk about Ganawange's history. And grade 11, we talk about the issues that affect people in Ganawange. 
like membership and economics and jurisdiction, things like this, where grade 11s, they can get into that kind of stuff. They can handle that kind of stuff. So that's what we do. So all the programs have some basis of indigenous culture as much as we can get. I mean, some things can't. I don't think Jim has anything, but, you know, that's basically how it works. Um, I'm running out here, guys. I didn't write anything, so, uh, but that's okay. Um, the kids, the kids overall, overall, the kids have no problem with all of this. We have a whole bunch of kids that are really traditional minded. Okay. Then we have some who are a little bit and some who have not a lot of tradition in their life. But overall, I think that it, it's made a big difference here. Um, at the local longhouse, uh, I don't know where you were, 207? Some, some were, half were there, and half were at the cultural center. Okay, so if you were at the longhouse at 207, right now most of the, the chiefs in the longhouse have been students that came here. A lot of them have come to this school, and we feel that the culture that we teach them in classes and all of this helps them to stay focused on, on uh, tradition and that. And it's been going on like that for 40 years now. So uh, the first kids now are in their 40s and 50s, and so they're, um, they're leading now. Uh, so the longhouse tradition stuff, all that, the language, is slowly getting stronger, I'd say, in the long run. The language problem is uh, still there. There's a lot of people that don't speak in Kahnawake. Me. Okay. There's a group of people that are in one age group, probably from about 55 years old to about 65. That age group really has very few speakers. Um, now that I do tours in, in Ganawage, about two years ago when I was doing a tour, I, uh, whoever the people were were asking me questions about language and I went, wait a minute. I said, I realized then that I'm a victim of residential schools because my parents and grandparents didn't teach me the language. And I was like, well, I'm a victim, I didn't know this, and, but I figured it out, and so now when people ask me, I tell them that I don't have the language because of residential schools, and I never, it never entered my mind before that. So I don't speak, a lot of the kids are taking immersion courses now, uh, we have classes here, there's an immersion school in the town for elementary, we have, well, there's two elementary schools, and one is immersion. Uh, there's two, like, private schools, and one of them is immersion. And we have an adult program, and I, I was talking to somebody yesterday, and they have had 200 graduates. So they do, I think it's a two-year program, and it's intensive language learning. So they have 200 graduates. Uh, we have a few of them work. I think we have a few of them working here. We had, and um, so the language is struggling still, but it's uh, it's better than it was in the seventies. I don't know, Kenneth. It? It's a lot better than in the seventies. I think uh, with the younger age group, yeah. Yeah. In the seventies, the the older age group well, were 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 still speaking. Yeah. It's, it's that lost generation between the, our elders and, and the young me. people that make uh, yeah, me. Uh, uh, oh, especially. Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm not that old. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm a victim of the uh, of the uh, Indian day school system. I, I was not allowed to speak English. I was well, nothing about my culture. Yeah. And, and when I left elementary school to go to high school, I, I was defenseless when when non-natives would challenge my my Mohawkness. I, I could not defend myself. I mean, I, mean, I did. But pulling things out of the air. Yeah. And yeah. it led me on a life long, long, long journey to where I am today. Yeah. When I was around in the 90s, there was a split in the community. This is probably where I was out there. I was here between the traditionals and the non traditionals. Is that split still there, or have you learned? Um, <laughs> uh, as far as uh, the politics in the, the community go, um, 
I'd say that the traditional people have increased their numbers over the years, and the bank council system has lost voters or, or followers. And I'd say that there's a big population in Gunawaga who are just sitting there in the middle. They, they, don't, they don't vote in the, the bank council election. They don't vote traditional, but there's a big gang that are right in the middle. And I think that comes from the religion thing, though. Because I grew up at the Catholic Church, okay? And the kids that come to school here don't go to church. The majority of them in the community, teenagers, don't go to church. So they're slowly trying to find something. And some of them are, are slowly turning towards the traditional way of life. So it's slowly changing over the years. And, and like I said, the traditional people have increased their numbers. You, you started here at year seven. So uh, did you say you started seven, year seven? Yeah. With grade seven. Oh yeah, we start with grade seven. I can here. translate into English because I'm from Australia. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, okay. So, I, I was just wondering, what do you do about early childhood education and uh, and traditional language and early childhood education? Well, like I said, we have two elementary yeah. schools. One is totally immersion, okay. and the other one is uh, uses does three languages: French, English, and Mohawk. And four, four I'm going to the other two. The other also, two. There's also a step by step in Gurdi Manoru. Oh, yeah. That, well, Gurdi Manoru and first and us, Indian Way School, one is total immersion and one is partial. So there's four schools, really, main schools. And we have a, the language nurse, we have the, the moms or the babies. Oh, yeah. They come got in, that they come in at an early age and you speak to the babies in the language. Oh. Yeah, so that's right, right from like maybe yeah. six months old, up all the way Yeah, up. my grandson, who uh, was two and a half in September, started going there with his mom. That's who I'm supposed to babysit, Jackie, yeah, soon. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, yeah, him and his mom were going in September, and uh, but then she jumped into a McGill course for teaching, so so they stopped going for that. But he was learning pretty quick in yeah, that so one. You get the year. Yeah, yeah. I have a question in the back. Yeah, I was just wondering how many students come to the school here. Two fifteen. Two fifteen. It actually goes up and down a little uh, over the years, and yeah, and different years. I think the low was like 160 one year way back like yeah. and the highest we've been to was about 300 yeah. almost yeah. Yeah. yeah and you know it changes back and forth i see my hand here mm. uh, when it, and, and how many students graduate each year uh, approximately 30 give or take a few it depends uh, yeah. every summer huh every summer or every, every, every year we have we have a high graduation rate yeah. Like maybe eighty percent of our grade eleven kids will graduate. We'll graduate. Usually graduate. Maybe about sixty percent of them will go out to colleges and universities. You know. So. so I have one question, then yours and yours. <laughs> Thank you so much for having us today. Thank you also for calling your boss as a boss of a household. I'm sure she appreciates it. <laughs> years, um, well right now we don't have a carpentry construction, but that's where me and Dave were for a long time. And the success for that was real simple. The guys would leave here and they would be able to build homes. And in the community right now, we're hurting for that. The guys in the community now are going, well, where's your, where are your kids? Because we haven't had carpentry for about eight years now, construction carpentry. So that was a success thing. So for me and Dave, who used to be with these guys like for three years, it was seeing them now, like there's one in the gym right now, one of the best carpenters around. His name is Garrett, and he's downstairs there, and he gives back now, he's a wrestling coach, and he's provided for his family with his carpentry skills. So that's a big success for me and Dave, and we have a whole bunch of guys like that. Our carpentry program had about 80% success rate at putting them in jobs. And so that was really easy to judge. 
Um, so, uh, the academic students. Well, do you, we have a lot of people that do going for teaching. We have a lot of teachers that come back. Yeah. Back to teachers in there, but we also have a. Uh, we have the language program here in Gunwagi. We want more or less more speakers. So a lot of our kids that graduate goes up to this program for two years. And at the Milwaukee Immersion School, we, we need these teachers. So a lot of our kids are from here and graduate and become teachers in a language. We, we have really high success rate in that. Yeah. Teachers coming back to teach the language. So academically, um, we're, we see it. Because everybody stays here too. So we see them as they, they grow and they have families. We know what's going on. And, Oh yeah, I had two questions more this way, I don't remember. Okay, she had one first, and you had one, okay? And then somebody there. Um, in regards to your school calendar, do you follow the September to June, or do you, or is your school calendar more uh, your seasonal cultural? No, 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 we follow September to June, but we have Belvin. We, we follow September to June, but we, we have our, our ceremonies built into it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and uh, I'm going to leave that for Dave to explain where he was last week. I'm not going to touch that one. Okay. Okay. Yeah. This, this goes back to something Jackie was talking about. This baby education business, can you tell us more? <laughs> the baby no, education. No, no, no. Okay, I can. It's, it's oh, called the language. Yeah. The language yeah. nest. It's yeah. for young mothers. Yeah who have preschool children. So what they do is the moms go there with their preschool children, like my, my daughter and my two-year-old grandson went, and they would be in there during the day doing activities, and they all speak in the Gundaha language. So the kids are picking it up all day. They do little activities with them to teach them language, and the moms are learning the language at the same time as the kid. So they were. My daughter was really doing good. Then, then she went to McGill. <laughs> Very impressed with how everything's coming together, you guys, for the community and taking full charge of it. But one of the questions that's probably always lingering out there is, how do you pay for it? Without having subsidies from somebody else. Or um, we're funded by the um, federal government. Federal government. It's through Canada, everything is funded through that. But, but the different schools in the community are funded differently. The, we have an education center, which is like a school board, which takes care of three of the schools. Yes. Three of the schools are taken care of by that. And I said there were two like private elementary schools. They have to scrounge around for their own funding. I mean, we don't have all the funding we need all the time. Uh, we have to do that too, but we have most of uh, the basic stuff is covered, like the electricity, teacher salaries, but when we wanted to go for a trip to the Mohawk Valley, we had to find monies wherever we could get money to, to fund our trip, and uh, the length of our trip and what we did depended on how much money we could raise, so that part you know, we're putting a lot of proposals. We, we write a lot of proposals to yeah. a lot of companies out there and everything else. A lot of uh, places that are give, willing to give money. You know, we do get, we take money we get. So, and then for program, especially a lot of the traveling for the culture and everything else that involves, like, like well, they, uh, they will explain a little bit more about the culture and everything else, what you do here at the school. But we're putting a lot of proposals. So, does that mean that you, sorry, <laughs> does that mean that you have a lot of federal requirements? Like standards that you have to follow, or is it flexible? It's flexible because education, uh, because we get it from the Moa Council gives some money, and he just it's pretty nice because Moa Council just gives some money to education, and you don't there's no like oh you got to do this, you got to do that, and we kind of control the money ourselves, and we know where the money can go to and everything else. We know like for special needs, there's not a lot of money, so we do have like you know reach out for things or just basically do it on our own. With the kindness of people's heart, volunteers and stuff that want to come in and help. But they're pretty strict with that. Even with our, because a lot of people go, well, you know, <coughs> you sit your diploma because you are like an individual school and, and, and from the province of Quebec, and Quebec is so strict about diploma and everything else. But we have agreement that these sit our diplomas and everything else because we don't follow right to include the MEQ of Quebec, the, the curriculum. We develop our own curriculum because we want to be unique. We want our culture to stay strong. 
and we want our lounge to stay strong. So that's our forefront of the school. But even for science, we incorporate our culture into science. So, you know, the kids get a, a lot more than they would if they went on the outside. Any more questions? Oh, how did you receive your accreditation? We, uh, we work with uh, the ministry way, way back. And we, we, the guy that was there, we just had a few meetings with him. We had to show him our curriculum and what we were doing and everything else, and, and our testing and everything else, and that's how we got it. Yeah, just working and just getting a group together and just, you know. Well, we, do have it, we do have it evaluated every yep. few years. Yep. Like uh, two years ago, I know the math curriculum was evaluated by McGill. McGill sent some people over and they stayed for a few days or weeks and they checked everything and said, yeah, these are, well, these are on the right track, basically. Yeah. I was just uh, wondering how uh, you bring lands and resources and traditional practices into your teachings. Lands and resources and traditional practices. Okay, we'll save that for Dave. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he will explain all that. Yeah, because he, um, he does a lot. They have a lot to do with the culture and a lot of stuff that to do with kids and everything else because we want to continue. Definitely because we know they're teenagers and everything else and there's going to be things that's happening in their life. We do have counselors that work here, uh, are really related to the culture, the medicines and all that stuff. We teach the kids the medicines they need to pick and all that stuff. So Dave's going to explain. You want to explain, Dave? In a few minutes. I'm, I'm, yeah. gonna, I'm running away. Okay. You're running. <laughs> checking. Go on, man. She, they, yeah. she, she didn't, she didn't she did call before, me back yet. Before, yeah, yeah. You know, I was just wondering, do all kids in the community go through the school, or are there other public schools that they attend? Everybody has a choice of which school they want to go to. You know, there, it's, it's a choice of the parents. A lot of the kids that we do get here are parents that graduated from the school. So we end up always having a big group that comes back. And then some kids will go on the outside, like uh, to private schools or public schools, Sometimes a lot of them come back because they're too overwhelmed. And they find that like here, it's a family. They got the support system. And they know that if they're going to fall, we're going to pick them up, <coughs> dust them off, and put them back on their feet and help them. And they're going to have, make mistakes along the way and that we're always going to be helping them with their mistakes so, you know, they can succeed. Any more questions? No. Okay, so, um, I'm going to go home so that I don't get in trouble in a minute. And uh, Dave's going to talk to you a little bit about his trip that he just made, okay? because it was one of the questions, and then talk about some of the cultural things that we do and some of the forests and some of the land that we work with, because uh, uh, he does a lot of that right now. And I got to go. You owe me. <laughs> We just want, because I know there's people from all over and everything else, we want to know if you want to share some of your, your effort, your, where your guys are from, or a little bit, or, you know, because it seems like it's just us talking. And, you know, so we just want, because I know people from all over just want to know if anybody want to share something, or, because I did, uh, did, we have one student that's here. That we probably have a lot of people here with the teaching background. Put up your hand if you have a teaching background. No? So you have Because I know, like, we, we, I just invite one student and everything else just to, to, to uh, listen to you guys, too, and just hear your stories, too. Just to, if I may, uh, there was one question a while ago about, like, education and curriculum. Um, I'm part of the French department, and every second year or so, and actually over the last couple of years, we have an immersion program at one of the schools, and um, it was last year. I believe. It was evaluated. Um, their standards were actually above what you get in some of the public schools off the reserve, like in Montreal. So the immersion program at Canada is actually quite high. And we're, this year we have started the REACH program over here. So we're bringing in some of the kids from Calgary who are in the immersion program over there. Some of them are coming over here to the REACH program and we're trying to build up the French program that way. Um, our program for French also doesn't strictly follow the curriculum set out by the provincial governments. What happens is that we also incorporate a lot of the culture. 
So we have that leeway to like, <coughs> excuse me, step away from like, uh, let's say some of the things are the workbooks that they use, develop their own workbooks, which are more culturally based. Um, in fact, they're some of the material is like specifically for kind of walking. Um, it's relatable to our students. So it's a little easy to yeah. transmit for that required by your yeah, We do have enriched <coughs> French, he said. We also have enriched kind of ghetto. We have kids that are coming in and, and really fluent in a language. We don't want them to lose that language. <coughs> we do have enriched kind of ghetto too, of course, it goes, you know, so the kids get both. Up to work on that. So, right. Dave, Dave. Dave. Okay, ready? <laughs> 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 you know, do you love me today? I asked you to stay late. <laughs> 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 so, Sengwa Zamo Buego, Kunyak Paje, Nayojats, Wakunur Rado. My name is Kunyak Paje. Welcome everybody from wherever it is that you come from onto our territory. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you. So, uh, yeah, where do you start, right? Um, first of all, the first thing I like to say is um, there's a lot of people in our community who send their children off school, off res, because they think of the education over there as maybe a little bit <coughs> superior. Um, that our diplomas aren't really worth the paper that they're written on. And we have so many success stories, starting right from the first graduates of our high school who went on to the University of Massachusetts and graduated from there. And just more recently, uh, my own children who graduated not too long ago, one's an industrial designer and one's a certified architectural technician in the province. So there's nobody anywhere who can tell me that our diplomas aren't worth the paper that they're written on. Um, so we need to keep that dream of our school that the ladies, we had, we, had, we had founding ladies of the school. And these ladies were called, a lot of people call our people the why nots. Can't do that. Well, why not? <laughs> well, we, we, we can't. Well, why not? Right? When they needed money to start the school, they went right to Ottawa and they knocked on the guy's door and the secretary said, sorry, he's in a meeting, he's on the phone, he's somewhere, somewhere. So they found the chair, they camped out and they said, he's got to come here sometime, right? And they waited for him. And they waited for him. And um, yeah, they got the school started. And the, and the dream of the school of being rooted in our, in our culture and tradition is um, something that's being hung on to. Not forgotten, but certainly being hung on to at many levels. Um, I'm in the Wayne's boat of being a survivor, I guess, of Indian day school and part of the legacy of not having, being taught the language because of all the residential school stuff that went on and the multi-generational traumas and the whole, everybody's aware of those kinds of things, I think. I won't get into it too deeply. Uh, learning, learning the language is a real struggle for me. I don't learn well off of paper. A, I, I would rather be like those little babies in the language nest who are immersed in something where I can see actions being translated to words being translated to actions and doings, and then I can start making connections. And that's the kind of learner that I am. So there's a question here about successes. Yeah, successes are, are, there's so many successes, but a lot of them are really, really small successes, small baby steps. And no matter how, how well we do sometimes in our own community, there's this, there's this phenomenon that says it's not good enough. And we continue to send our children out for whatever reason. Yeah. Um, so when I, when I got the teaching job, I was like Dwayne. I got pulled off of the roof for an interview. And I was actually, I had tar under my nails and I walked in and I had my work clothes on and there was a couple of suits sitting there with briefcases and I walked in and I said, there's no way I'm getting this job. And in September, I was standing in front of a class. And as I was standing in front of the class, I said, okay, now what? Um, no experience teaching. But I knew how to build. So, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to allude to 1990, right? Because in 1990, you've heard about the armed standoff that was in Ganassadage and uh, the fact that the Canadian government actually sent more troops here, 4,500, than they did to Afghanistan that year. Um, 
So I was standing in front of a group of children, young men, I won't say children, young men who were armed for 78 days in 1990. And there was a lot of anger, there was a lot of hate. I hate this person, that person, and this race and that race. And when I read our mission statement, it was finding out how to get our children to be strong Humbuy people. Really, really tough thing if you don't know how to do it yourself, right? So I had to start learning. When I was 30 years old, 29 years old, I went to my first ceremony. I went to my first harvest festival. <clears throat> Never been in the longhouse before. I wasn't allowed. My parents told me, don't go there, you're gonna get in trouble, right? The traditional people, they're, they're just trouble. So you're a kid, you listen, right? Um, so. I went, and I kept going, and I kept going. And then I remember my mom asking me one day, she said, Dave, why are you getting into this kind of thing? And I said, I think it's more I feel like I'm getting out of stuff than into stuff, right? So I have to learn who I, who I am, and it's still a process, let me, let me, uh, I guarantee you that, right? To be able to stand in front of a group of people and talk about who you are, and try and get them to understand who they are, then I have to understand who I am first. So as we as we talk about indigenous education, there was a there was a man not long ago, uh, a few years ago, who stood up and raised the question, said, How do we get more indigenous education into our into our schools? Tough question. Can anybody answer that? And give me a really solid answer? It's a tough question. So I looked at the man who asked this question, and I decided how many people in the whole room that I could actually put in that circle with him, knowing language and culture and song and ceremony and being immersed in, into actually who we are. And then I looked at the other end of the spectrum where there's a lot of people who have no idea. New people in our community coming from somewhere and wanting to teach, getting a job and even members of our own community who really don't have an idea who they are, except that they're Mohawk, that they're Ungwe Ungwe, but it stops there because there's never been that, that movement to find out who they are, and I think it's mostly fear-based. So when I look at the spectrum of all of that, and then thinking about going to workshops and listening to people talk and having all smiles, once that door closes behind your back, then you're on your own. And the only thing you can teach them is what you know, right? So I had to find out, and I'm still finding out who I am as an Ungwe Ungwe person. And it's not easy. It's not an easy journey, but it's a great one, let me tell you. I've learned so many things in the last few years about who I am so I can actually help our children. Because they want to see examples. They don't want to really hear it from a book. Right? Anybody can read a book and throw information on the board and say, okay, here's how it is. But if you can actually, for me, if I can actually show them and, and live that life, those are the kinds of role models that they need, I think. And so when we're, when we're getting children from other schools who are coming here in grade 9 and 10 and 11 because they actually want to graduate from Gunkalagi Survival School, they know that they're missing something. Just like we all know that we're missing something. We gotta have the, I think, courage to, to keep the dream of this school alive that our, that our, founding, that our founders had when they, when they conceptualized this thing and put all that time and love and energy and caring into what the school is supposed to be. So I'm a, I'm a holdout. Um, I'm an old school guy. I, I, I love the old school. I miss it terribly. Um, I have a really hard time with this building. It's new, it's nice, but I don't like it. <laughs> But I deal with it, right, on a daily basis. Yeah, um, I, I can go on and on and on, but I would rather answer questions. Yes. Do you take students out and do traditional practices? Yes, I do. Hunting? Um, not so much hunting. I, I like land-based skills. Um, we teach them hunting techniques, um, throw stick, fox walk, how to set traps, um, how to build shelters, how to start fires. Uh, fire by friction, using the landscape as having all of the things that we need in order to do that, yeah. yeah. All year? 
Um, we try to get out when it's really cold, but it's pretty tough. Yeah, because it gets pretty darn cold here sometimes. But um, yeah, I try to get out as often as I can. I love doing fire challenges with the kids. Right? You all get one match. <laughs> Go and get what you need and make a sustainable fire. Right? And uh, I've seen 14 year olds who don't know how to strike a match. <coughs> They know how to get the game level 375 problems. Seven extra lives in their game, but they don't know how to strike a match and build a fire. So um, one, of, one of the things that I do like to do is bring them out there and tell them, our, our, our children, that we need to learn how to disconnect so we can reconnect, right? I put up logos on the, on the, on the whiteboard or I'll draw them as best I can. Everybody knows Under Armour, everybody knows Nike, everybody knows Adidas, everybody knows all the corporate signs that are out there. I said, okay, go, go, go find me a sugar maple tree. Go and pick me some mullet. Go and find me some um, evening primrose so we can make some cordage. No idea, right? So those are the kinds of things that I value. I, I like doing it. It's fun. It's educational. It's hands-on. It's real. That's what I like to do. Can I add to that? Yeah. Hi. I'm Kathy. I'm a math and science teacher here at the school. And what we do is we do follow the Quebec curriculum for math and science, but we have leeway. So what I do is I sit down and I look through the curriculum, and I see where things like this can fit into the curriculum. And then I bring people into my classroom to help me bring the kids outside to do the survival skills. I also turn to other, I guess, corporations for help. Uh, right now I'm working with the engineers right at Borders, and they're coming into my classroom and we're doing the engineering design process with them. And a part of that was taking them outside with Dave and having him show them how to make um, structures. Yeah. 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 So I didn't know how to make a structure, so I turned to Dave to come out. And we took the kids outside. We went through the design process with them. They did the building outside. They're still standing in the back there, actually. We went to check on them today, and it was about three weeks ago. So they're still in good shape, and they're very excited to see that they're still standing. Uh, we also bring in a lot of uh, cultural content into the science. Um, when we're learning about simple machines and forces and motion, we built little canoes using only the material found at the back of school here. Uh, whenever I can see something that fits into the curriculum like that, I try to make it fit and I bring in people that may help me with it. Uh, we're also working with Promo Science, so we have a grant through them. And we partnered up with Planet in Focus. So every year we develop films with the students on an issue from the community that's important to them. So we turn to environment. Uh, a lot of students looked at the seaway and how it impacted the community when it was built. And they developed short three-minute films that were shown at the film festival in Toronto. Uh, some of the films are also chosen to be shown in New Zealand at the Mori Film Festival. So that's an annual thing that we do with our grade eight students. So every year we get into the community, they interview elders, and they look at what impacts their community to develop a film about it. So, are there teachings about the environment or resources, water, that you focus on specifically with the kids? I teach, um, I have to kind of reinvent myself after they close the carpentry department. Uh, not this lady. <laughs> All right. Uh, we're trying to get it back as best we can. So in reinventing myself and teaching new topics, um, I was forced to go in that direction. So whenever I have a chance, um, things are growing now, we'll make bark rattles, we'll talk about the importance of water, I teach a diet wellness and nutrition class, and how important it is to eat traditional foods. So decolonizing our diet, because we're in, I mean face it, we're in a decolonization process. In, in our communities, where we're trying really, really hard to fight, to get back what is ours. And by, by teaching about water and about plants and tree identification and medicines on the ground and edibles and foraging, um, yeah, as much as I can. That learning, learning that those foods that are out there that everybody sprays ground up on, right, to make their lawn look like a putting green, Okay, um, that we don't need to do that and we need to take care of the earth because in our creation story, everything was here first. 
We were last. We were last. So we're kind of guests here, right? If we die tomorrow, the world is going to continue. But if the world dies tomorrow, we're in trouble, right? So we need to know our place. And um, so, yeah, I do. And how many teachers do you have that are um, robot here from here? Mm -hmm. And also, for those that are teachers that are from here that don't have their um, self identity, do you have professional development or do you, does the school help them in any way to help them find that? Um, there are opportunities that are given throughout the year for people to take advantage of those kinds of things, yes. However, my own personal feeling about that is if we're going to learn about who we are, then we can't wait for somebody to say it's okay. We have to go and we have to do the best that we can all the time. So the teachers, we're in, a, we're in a little bit of a dilemma at times because there are people who are coming into our community whose hearts are pure and they want to help the kids. But there's also information that we don't really want to let them in on. Right? So some of the, some of the things that happen in community re regarding ceremony, it's kind of not their business. Not to be mean, but it's not theirs. So they can't have it. And the reason that they shouldn't have it is because they, they shouldn't be allowed, to, nobody should be allowed to take any culture, any, any tradition, any song from anywhere else and make it their own. So it's, it's kind of a real tough balancing act that, that gets done around that kind of issue. Yeah. I remember I was in the uh, Mesa Verde and we went to uh, the cliff dwellings and they had a kiva and there was a lot of people and there's something about something. There was, there was a lot of people around the kiva, and they were asking questions, and uh, the, um, the ranger there, the, the guy with the big hat, he says, it's for ceremonial and medicinal purposes. And they went, oh, cool. So when everybody left, I went up to the guy, and I said, what else do you know about it? He said, nothing. <laughs> he said, they won't tell me anything. He said, it's not my business. <laughs> right? So, that's the balancing act. We're always kind of like that. I don't know. Yeah. Is that a good yeah. answer? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I understand. So um, I have a 16-year-old who's in grade 10 in Strathcona High School in, in Edmonton, Alberta. And as part of this process around reconciliation, there's been this long-standing lack of teaching in public schools about residential schools, 60s schools. How do you, how do you as, a, as a school, manage, talk about, support those conversations with your with your own students and people? Having gone through that kind of system myself and seeing the kind of system that I'm in now, it's, it's easy for me as an individual. I can't speak for other people and how they manage that kind of thing, but making the, having, having been through it and being able to make those kinds of comparisons, um, there's this new thing, right, where the government says that if you're a survivor of an Indian day school, then you're entitled to 10 grand. And depending on the kind of evidence that you can produce, you might be entitled up to $200,000. I don't know who makes that decision, right? But I remember being in school and getting hit a lot and having my ears pulled and being embarrassed and being hit on the back and being made to go to church and being made to do my first communion, right? So living, living through that kind of thing and translating it into what I know now, what I've learned to this point, when, they have, when there's questions like that that come from the students, I'll do my best to answer based on my own experience in my classroom. Yeah. Is it actually an element of the curriculum that you're teaching that history now? Or in the, in the yeah. social studies class, yes, it is. Yep. There's, a lot of, there's a lot of talk about um, racism and um, yeah, yeah, language arts. They do notebooks and, and all. So there, there is there is a lot of discussion around that. And but that, that, I think the hardest part is going home yeah. for the kids because if they don't have a support system at home where mom and dad or even grandma or anybody who is has those kinds of things to share, and the child is on their own after that, it's 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 tough on them. 
Well, it must be hard as a school to think about that too, because you're also providing some of those mental health supports, right? And there's only so much. I think too, like with what you talked about, Richard, but we have a, like a lot of project-based learning with the, the school here and everything else, and uh, we really, because Dave just went, uh, the Great Lab just went to Walk Valley and everything else, and then Dave just actually came back. Uh, we just took a bunch of boys on the bus into the mountains and everything else. Um, so, so what we do though is we just not just in social studies this topic is taught. Because we find that if you just taught in one subject, kids will not restrict, retain it, you forget it easily. So we have teachers working together as a group. We have non-native teachers, we have native teachers here working together. And we do have PD for, for our non-native teachers to learn about our culture, learn about things. Because you're going in and you're a non-native person, you're teaching our kids and they're hacking certain way, and you're wondering why you're hacking this way. So you have to educate these people that you're coming in, you have the same compassion that we have, even though we got treated differently when we went to school, but we still have to have that same compassion to, for our kids. There's days that kids are going to come in, you got issues at home, and you got to know how to deal with them. You don't be just become a teacher, you become a mom, a counselor, you know, whatever, you know, for all these kids, and the kids need that. You know, I think a lot of times with the kids, even, um, I was off for a while because my husband had open heart surgery, but when I came back and one of the kids came up, he goes, I'm so glad you're back, Jackie, our mom is back now. And that's what they consider you, like, you know, you're your mom, but they can go and talk to you, okay, I have a problem with Jackie, I just can't go to class, I'm just frustrated. And I know they, and they, they, they got that comfortable, they got people in the school that they can go to. And I think that kind of helps the kids, but they need that encouragement because they're not getting at, getting at that home sometimes. It's not your parents' fault, it's just what they went through. We gotta break that cycle for them and help them and show them there's a way to help. We reach out to the, all the colleges that our kids go to to make sure they have that support. Guys, you know, come on, if you if we tell them like, you're struggling, our doors are always open there. I remember a couple of teachers going, bringing a couple of kids in, okay, what are you struggling with? What do you need help with? You know, and they need to start, and now they're realizing, okay, I can help other people. So like, you know, past graduates you know, are helping other people and everything else. And that's why I think we need embedded in all like language arts, science, even math, the all subjects should be embedded into it. And that's why we have teachers meeting together to do their uh, their content for the year. For every uh, for every term we have a content that works on. We just had our film festival, who you are, and they had to interview people in the community and look at yourself and everything else and watch the film. You look at medicine, you see, look at, um, he even talked about uh, the hardworking men, the men that went away and everything else, and how would they build their own culture in New York City. You know, so you've got to get them back. You just can't just be in one subject. You can't, it will not work if it's just in one subject. It won't. You want to talk about your class? Yeah. Yeah. I, would, I like to know, uh, as part and part of your uh, survival school, mm -hmm. Do you think there's going to come a time in which can we develop the program to help empower or deprogram all those people that have been cut up in this inter intergenerational trauma? Do you think it's possible? Or have you, have you ever thought about it? Because on this, we address it now head on. This intergenerational trauma will continuously manifest itself to another generation. So I believe uh, as a survival school, I believe you know, there could be an opportunity here to begin to address how can we assist, how can we have people that are caught up into this dilemma of intergener intergenerational trauma? Well, for me the most important thing when I, when I consider that question is doing my best to live what I talk, I, it, I have to be able to walk my talk. Otherwise, it doesn't it doesn't mean anything. So one of the things that I heard and it, it kind of resonates with me is there's a lot of talk about healing. It's it's all over. It's in truth and reconciliation. And people have to heal, and we need to heal in order to be this and that and the other thing. But if we want to heal, we also have to be willing to give up the things that made us sick in the first place. Right? If, we don't, if we're not willing to give that up, then there's not going to be healing. It's going to be surface stuff. So they're putting a band-aid on the wound. 
Um, we got to get down to the nitty gritty a little bit more and um, <coughs> role model well for our children as best we can all the time, not when, we, not when it suits our needs. And one of the things that impressed me years ago, I was in Arizona and I met a man, his name Charlie Stewart from Lakota, he was from Pine Ridge. And we were at a diabetes conference and they had a, we were at a break and they had a little pool table and I said, Charlie, you play pool? He says, yes I do. I said, well, on the way, I saw a really nice pool table. I had carved legs, leather pockets, a nice red felt, and a nice big lamp over the top. Really nice looking pool table. And I said, so I saw this really nice pool table. Let's go do a couple of laps. He says, yeah, okay. So we got to the door, and he stopped right at the threshold. And he was about six foot four, braids, earrings, looks at me, and he says, can't go in there, Dave. I said, why not? <laughs> and he said, because I don't go where my children aren't allowed. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to excuse my language. I call that a holy shit moment in my life because I said, holy shit. That's, as, that's what our children need. That's, we, we, we do so many things that we don't want our children to do as adults. And if we follow just that simple advice of not doing what our we don't, we don't want our children to go there, we don't go either. We don't want our children to do it, and we don't do it either. And th that's the kind of role modeling that they need. They need to see that, in my view. So, from the moment I heard that, I followed that. And I don't go where my children aren't allowed. Now I have a granddaughter. I'm not going to go where my granddaughter's not allowed either. So, those are, those are the kinds of things, I think, that need to be carried with people to teach their children <coughs> What is boundaries? To show them boundaries that they're that they're real for everybody, and we, we we need to follow some of them in order to be successful. That's who we are. I don't know if that answered your question. Uh, can I say a word on that? Sure. Um, this is the Hakatunius. Yeah. I'm gonna sit down. He talks fast, so. I don't know. I'm gonna talk fast. Yeah. The Hakatunius push your jets. Rocks kare wagay ni wagit na roda tano kano wagay ni gitu yu. Uh, my name is Tehat Katunis Bush. Uh, I'm a former graduate here at KSS. Uh, I'm Bear Clan, and I live in Um Currently, I've been living off of the reservation for the last three years, um, on and off. I was one year in Ontario, uh, one year in Sherbrooke, one uh, one summer in PEI. And one thing I've I've noticed after living off the reservation for uh, for such a long not such a long time, but so it's like some people never even leave the reservation, so three years is a lot to some people. And I realized that I didn't hear my language every day. I wasn't hanging out with my teachers, my friends. Um, I wasn't learning my culture like I do in social studies. Um, and it made me sad. It really made me sad because um, it, it had an effect on my mental health. Because as a traditional Mohawk who grew up his whole life in the longhouse, learning the ceremonies, uh, singing the songs, learning the language, all the gone. It's like, you know, uh, one day I just couldn't go to ceremonies anymore. Um, I couldn't go and learn my language. I couldn't hear my songs. And it, it, it does have an effect on your mental health. And especially for Aboriginal people who say live in the cities, who live uh, off their communities, who don't live in the thick of it where, where it's actually happening. Um, it, it has an effect on the mental health after a while. It's like, well, what am I doing? I'm not learning my language, or I don't know my language. I don't know who my people are. I don't know where we come from. Why am I on this reservation? Why am I, why is there three highways? Why is there a seaway? Why is there railroads? Why is there power lines? Bridges. Bridges, bridges, everything. It's, you know, um, it, it makes you question who you are. Um, and as the question of uh, interge intergenerational trauma, um, as a youth, I today is my 19th birthday. I just turned uh, 19. Oh, wow. <laughs> 19 years young. <laughs> and um, one thing I, I've seen, uh, who, which has really kind of made me like sad, sad in my soul, is this growing, this ever growing uh, dissatisfaction with with not knowing. We don't know. Why don't we know? How come we're not taught? You know, and it's changing. It really is changing. People are getting in, like the, the youth are that they're getting into it. That's all they, they are just they're just trying their hardest to learn. Um, one thing 
um, is because our parents uh, haven't taught, uh, have, weren't taught uh, they're known as the lost generation because they, 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 didn't, they didn't learn it. They were in the, the Sunday schools, um, the Sunday day schools, and sorry. This school is something so special, so, so, so special because of what we have. We, there's no school that exists like this anywhere else. We're the, the beautiful, beautiful family this school is. Beautiful family. Um, and to beat the inter, intergenerational trauma, I've actually talked to uh, our principal, uh, former principal, my former principal, uh, Jackie today, about creating some sort of program to talk about just how important this school is because there's an ever-growing, um, well, you know, we all like the high school. It's like no one likes school. It's everybody dragging their feet. And I don't want to go to class, and I don't like my teacher, and I don't want to do my homework. I like my class. I love my class. Um, you know, why do we have to learn this? Why do I need to know math? Why do I need to know my language? Um, and there is a small population of people that don't want it, don't want to learn it. It's, it's, it's because they have it, they don't know how precious it is and how amazing it is that we get this. He's like, you know, like, you, you didn't get this in high school, you didn't get this in high school, you know? Dwayne, uh, Dwayne that was here earlier, he didn't get that in high school, but we do. And we don't see how important it is. And uh, I want to create a program to kind of reinstill the importance of the school, um, starting with the youth, because uh, there's an ever-growing you know, like, I don't want, I don't want to learn, I don't want to, because they don't realize that once it was taken away from us, and we can lose it again. It is very possible of us losing it again, you know? The only a small percentage of the, of the pup of the town speaks, right? So. We just, we just really wish we would have had that attitude with you. <laughs> that summer. 
So I came back a new person, and a lot of people were very, uh, it's like weren't too sure, you know. It's like a you know a snake, a snake bites you once, you're not gonna let it bite you again. <laughs> so I never, I never judge the people who who still look down upon me or or didn't necessarily like me. And I I, I went up to the people that I, I hurt, and I told them I says. I know why you didn't like me. It's like, I know why you treated me the way you treated me. Um, I'm here to tell you that you had every right to not like me. You had every right to dislike me, to not want anything to do with me. But I'm telling you now, I'm changed and I'm different. I no obligation to like me now is who I am, but you know, um, yeah, zero obligation, don't feel any pressure, but I'm telling you, I understand what I did was wrong and I wasn't a nice person. Um, and I want to fix that. I want to fix that. I want. I want the kids who are having problems, like she said. You know, the kids come to her and like, you know, Jackie, I can't. I can't go to class. I just can't. I can't. Um, and I think having a peer, someone who freshly just graduated out of the school, uh, who is only I've only been out of the school for two years, um, it, it really helps to. Well, when you hear something from your parents and you hear it from a friend, it's very different. You have your parents and your teachers tell you do your homework eat your food, do this, do your chores, do that, and it feels like it's, it's this type of scolding. But when your friends, when you hear it from your friends, it's way different, and you hear it in a way different tone. Um, and being freshly 19, I want to create some sort of like student counselor uh, program where we just sit down and talk with the kids and be, what's up? What's happening with you? How's home? What's going on? Because when I was here in school, I didn't necessarily feel comfortable enough to go talk to the counselor because it's like if we have problems as kids, what are they gonna? You know, you, you're you're gonna get shot down. Oh, you're just a kid. What problems can you have? Like all you have to do is is, is focus on school. But in reality, that isn't that isn't the truth. Um, and I hope that when we can create this uh, uh, this program, it'll really reflect in the grades. <laughs> just said I'm really really hoping that was learned from his experiences here at survival school and the kind of lessons the kind of teachings that we try to impart on our children um, I, had a, I had a lady once who, who told me that um, we're all comfortable in this in our own circle we know what scares us we know what we we know what we know and we like it so every now and then you got to step out with two feet into the darkness let your eyes adjust and you'll be amazed at what you're going to see. Okay? So in learning, for me, my own journey, in learning about who I am and the things that I, that I do know, that I can speak about, that's what I had to do. I had to leave my comfort zone. That's the only way to learn. And you've got to face the fear of, of not knowing. Uh, and it's, it's a lot of things. And if you don't, not knowing myself was terrifying. But I have to because I have the children now to stand in front of. Me, right? So it was an important lesson for me when I when I heard that. Any other questions? Can I say one more thing? Sure. I like to applaud his young fellows. He actually answered my question. Yeah. And I want to take that lesson learned from him and take it home and hopefully I will have that groundwork broken and begin to implement mm. and to emulate what this school is all about. This is what it can produce. And I, I thank you very much. I, I, I forgot your name. Push. 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 Thank you very much. That's a lot of work, right? <laughs> I just have a comment. I also want to applaud you, Bush, uh, for you to share that project idea of yours. I really hope it runs and succeeds and spreads like wildfire even beyond. I think this concept of peer-to-peer -peer learning, especially amongst children, is something that we're really missing out on, not tapping into that, that potential. And we see it amongst hunter-gatherers still all around the world where children are teaching younger children in, in valuable skills. Um, and, and I wonder why we don't do it all over the world in our education system. So, congratulations, and, and I wish you all the best. Thank you. Yeah. I just want to say, because you talked about, like, the kids won't go to counselors and everything else, right? So we, we, uh, had, we developed a room just, we started last year, we got more developed this year. And it's a dropping center, we, more or less what we do. But, because kids are not comfortable with counseling, going to somebody, you know, we have native counselors there and everything else. 
So the counselors reach out to the kids and they just have like a dropping zone. Hey, come in, just have, relax, have a cup of tea, do this, do that. And I find with that this year implementing in the school, I find the kids are more open to come to the counselor. Mm -hmm. Because now they know like, oh, well, you know, this person is there, I can actually, I feel comfortable enough. There's no worse than a, a kid going to a counselor, you know, and they're forcing their opinion on them. You have to first, with, especially with our kids up on here, you have to, you're not going to come up and say what's the problem. They'll take time, they'll beat around the bush, and what they'll do is they wait, they'll, they'll haul you up, they'll look at you, and they'll, they'll read you, see where you're coming from, what you're doing, everything else. I think with this program, this year at school, we have more kids that are more open because of the room opening up. They, you know, they drop in at lunchtime, have a cup of tea, they talk, and they maybe just, just maybe 10, 15 kids are eating dinner at lunchtime, and it's always open. And you know that they start getting used to the counselors, and now we do talk in circles and all that stuff in that room. So it's a relaxing room for the kids to go to. You know, that's what you need to